Hello and welcome to Murder Dictionary Podcast. I'm Brianna and that's Courtney. Hello. We're back. We're back. We took a little bit of an extended break. But Just a little bit. Yeah. So we're back with another case. So before we get into what we have for you today, we like to remind you that in our show notes, you can find links to our social media if you want to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can find links to our Patreon uh, if you want to get access to bonus episodes and early release episodes and ad-free content as well. And you can find a link to our Threadless if you want to buy some merch. We've got t-shirts and phone cases and all sorts of good stuff. And what's the last thing that I'm missing? We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. That's the first we're thing on Twitter. I said. <laughs> no, I thought the first thing. No, you said something else. Oh. Um... But we're listening to each <laughs> other intently. As we do this. We also have links to the resources that we use to research this episode. That's I knew I was forgetting something. That's what it was. So, um, yeah, if you want to read more on tonight's case, if you want to get more information, then check out the show notes. Every week, there's links to our resources. And I just realized that I forgot to put together the list of new patrons on Patreon. So I'm not going to read that because I didn't prepare it and that's my bad. But next week, I'll read off the new patrons on our Patreon this week. Sounds great. So, yeah. We're, we're on Facebook. We're on <laughs> Instagram. We're on Twitter. We have groups. It's tons of fun. We're there. We're having a great time. I feel We'd like love this for you has to happened join us. almost every episode where like you think that I didn't bring up social media <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like court really just didn't listen at all <laughs> you don't even know that I went to urgent care <laughs> because for so long it was hey you need to say something <laughs> I do. you need to say something <laughs> and so I went okay we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter. That's been your go-to. And that's just what I do now. <laughs> oh, I knew man. you went to urgent care. I'm just kidding. Oh, I'm like, it was in the text message and I read it. I'm just joking. Short-term memory <laughs> loss is a bitch, man. That's all I can say. So this is, I guess, our first episode. The worst episode no. ever. <laughs> It's our first episode back in the new year. 2020. I know. I haven't seen you in a hot minute. A lot has that. happened. Yeah. Yes. So sorry for the extended break. We took a little bit longer. Um, I know some of you know I got married recently and then also I got really sick. And so that's been a problem. Um, hopefully my voice isn't too messed up, but we're going to, you know, show must go on. We've got a new case and Always. a new letter. Yeah, new letter. So we've got M for music. And you know I take any opportunity to talk about musicians and bands and whatever. So we're definitely doing music for letter M. It's a way of life. It is. I agree. So we are talking about Carlo Gesualdo today. And this has the distinction of being the old timiest case. The oldest of old timey. Oldest of old timey. That we've ever done. And you know how much we love those to begin with? Yes. So this really does kick it up a notch, though. I scraped. Found this. This yeah. was old. This is a very deep cut. Hidden gem. Deep cut. This is a B-side right here. Perfect. Um, it was really striking to me just reading through everything. I mean, there's no justice in old-timey cases. It's so often that it's people just get away with things or... I don't know, just run away, they can escape to another town, whatever it is. But it's particularly striking in this one. Unless you are wearing a monocle, top hat, or a cane, you are not getting justice. Right, you're not valuable enough. No, and if you have anything to do with a religious affiliate, you're good. You right. can do whatever you want. Yes. Dialed in. <laughs> Kill away. Carlo Gesualdo was born in March of 15. 66 in Venosa, Italy, where his family acquired land a few years prior. They're wealthy enough to acquire land 
let's just start at that base point that we know. Inherited land going through the generations. Right. Good start. Carlo was the Count of Conza, a title held in the Campania region of Italy, which made him second in line to become the Prince of Venosa. Carlo and his entire family were all important, powerful people, completely up and down the ranks, both sides of his family, right? Stacked. So let's just go through some of those. His mother, Geronima, was one of six children from the prominent and wealthy Borromea family, who were the descendants of the famous banking family, the Medicis. This reminded me of... um... The Da Vinci Code. Yes. That was all I had going through my head. <laughs> Those colors. His father was Fabrizio Gesualdo, the Prince of Venosa, and his older brother, Luigi, was, of course, next in line to become the prince. His extended family was also stacked with a list of influential figures. His grandfather was Giulio Cesare Borromeo, the Count of Arona, And their family was one of the most well-known and wealthy in the northern Italy region of Lombardy. His great uncle was Pope Pius IV, and his mother's brother, Cardinal Carlo Borromeo, was an advisor to the Pope who was a notable figure in the Counter-Reformation before ultimately becoming St. Charles Borromeo. It's a lot. They've got everything. Popes, saints. I mean, we've got everything in this family. Princes. And then we've got Carlo. (laughs) Right. And then little Carlo. And there's Carlo. Almost all five of his mother's brothers held high-ranking positions in the Catholic Church. Although Carlo was not first in line to become prince, it's really safe to say that he had a very easy life, especially for the time. And his family made sure that he always got what he wanted. It's like the heir and the spare. Right. You do whatever the hell you want, as we know. (laughs) But it's also kind of implied that he was spoiled, a bit narcissistic, and, you know, had some of those characteristics from a very early age. When you're second in line to be the prince, that just comes with the territory. Yes. Carlo's mother passed away when he was only seven years old. And his namesake, Uncle Carlo, requested that he be sent to Rome, where he would live with another uncle, Alfonso. When he got there, they th- he thought he was going to live with Carlo. And then he gets there and they're like, yeah, you're just going to stay with Alfonso. Like, it's cool. So I don't know That's if that shitty. was disappointing. Yeah. And like, I don't know if that was disappointing to him. If that was like sign of things to come. Like, oh, he doesn't matter. He's the spare. So just whatever. Send Uncle Alfonso. Right. Yeah. It might have been his first taste of just not being that important, right? Maybe. Could be. But also what I thought of was, it's so sad. I can't imagine losing your mom at seven. It's got to have lasting effects on your psyche. But then I think about the fact that we're talking about a seven-year-old in 1566, which is basically 30 today. Yeah. You know what I mean? Totally. When I think of old-timey cases, that goes through my mind constantly. This may have been a seven-year-old, but every seven-year-old probably had three jobs at this point. He's waiting for his W-2. Like, he's going (laughs) to file taxes this year for all the contracting, (laughs) subcontracting he does. So I do feel bad for him. I know that this has to have had some sort of lasting effect and really changed him to lose his mom at seven. But it is different losing someone at seven today versus back then. It's It's far more common. Yeah, you got to keep going. You got to move forward and just keep moving or you're going to get run over. At the time, his uncle Alfonso was the dean of the College of Cardinals, the group of cardinals that are appointed by the Pope and serve their post for life. Instead of being groomed to be the prince, like his older brother Luigi, Carlo was pushed towards a career in the church, which went along with, of course, his whole family's tradition. Although it may not have been the glamorous life that his older brother was living, Carlo still, again, had everything he ever wanted, and he lived an extremely privileged life. 
So he may have been in the church, but compared to other seven-year-olds, he's got a lot of opportunity. Yeah, he's not forced into a second job. (laughs) Right. At an early age, his musical talents were discovered, and he was able to explore his interests in all things music while he was at the church. He played the lute, which was a wooden instrument that was popular in the Middle Ages, that was technically in the violin family, but basically it looks something like between a guitar and a ukulele. He also played the harpsichord and guitar really well, and he was known for his singing. You know who else played the harpsichord? Who? Lurch. (laughs) He's very good. He's talented. Carlo began composing music professionally and used famous religious text as his lyrics. The church gave him his foundation of music, but he wasn't really committed to only making music based on religion. I think that that was the very first outlet he had and especially spending so much time in the church. But he wasn't really that type of person that was like so dedicated to God that he was only going to write about religion. No, I I completely agree. It's just important to point out the distinction between the two because some people are all about the religion. Other people are just like, well, yeah, I sing in the church because like that's where they let me sing. That's where they sing. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was Carlo. He specialized in madrigals, an a cappella composition for multiple voices to sing in Italian, which was a popular style in the Renaissance and Baroque eras. Did you happen to listen to any madrigals recently while you were looking through this or anything at all? I mean, they're just straight bangers. (laughs) I think you're joking. Bops? They're bops. I mean... This is music that was a big thing, right? And you can just, this is how times have changed because it's just like, what? Like when you're watching Monty Python and the and the Holy Grail mm-hmm. and they're all just, Misa Domine, <laughs> it's the most. Kind of like church meditative chanting almost. Misa blah, blah, blah. It's just like the most boring the word baroque is like perfect because it's just boring (laughs) it's just yeah i feel like the word baroque is just inherently this connotation to it that's very dull now you know what as i'm saying this though i am realizing that when i was listening to it i would just put it on and just let it go and it was a little like there's a soothing quality to it but it's because it's just noise Right. It's just hitting this like tone like the in your brain where you're just like, oh, OK, I'm listening to this now. And I just let it go for a while. But yeah, this was like the fucking pop jam yeah. at the time. It was extremely popular. Maybe if we get it together, we insert a clip of a madrigal here somewhere. <laughs> Got to be better than mine. I don't know. I think you did a really good job. Thanks. <laughs> He became very well known because his songs were considered especially creative and artistic for the time, since he utilized different styles in ways that were unique. Becoming a famous composer amplified the narcissism and selfishness he had first displayed as a young nobleman. Yeah, that's going to help. I mean, yeah, it just kicks it up a notch. Now he's not only like in line to be the prince, but now you got this talent. You're a star. So it, it wasn't good. And you don't have to be a nice guy, a good guy, an anything guy. You can just be this dude, Carlo, who's into music. Right. It You're wouldn't set. really matter. No. But I think, yeah, it turned him from a bratty kid to an insufferable adult that nobody really seems to want to be around, really, right? It's so good later than they yeah. talk about him. He's he's not a good guy. No. He's not a nice guy. Yeah. Not someone like you wanted to spend any time around. Right. He's downright obnoxious. And it's discussed again and again. Yeah. So his narcissism was very clear from the way that people talked about him. And I mean, he thought that he was the best and he would not stop talking about it ever. So I think it's just a combination, in my opinion, of like being raised as a potential maybe future prince, part of this royal family, 
plus the talents that he displayed, it just made him, you know, really narcissistic. Lucky for everyone around. (laughs) He began experiencing bouts of depression in his late teens. So he used music to express his feelings and continued to do so throughout the rest of his life. He wrote six books of madrigals in his life that are still revered today. If you're into that sort of thing. I'm telling you, the scene in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, they're walking along, hitting themselves in the face with boards. That's what we're listening to. It's a niche market. A little bit. While Carlo was focused on music, his brother Luigi was being groomed to become Prince of Venosa. But... He died unexpectedly in 1585. (gasps) Dun, dun, dun. Now what? Right. So now that's why we have a spare, as Courtney would say. There it is. There he is. So Carlo was only 18 at that time, and he was in good health. So he, of course, became Prince of Venosa in his brother's place. Carlo, of course, never expected to be the prince, so suddenly he realized he had to produce an heir or risk the estate reverting back to the papacy when he died. In 1586, when Carlo was 20, his father arranged for him to marry his first cousin, 24-year-old Maria de Avalos in the Church of San Domenico Maggiore in Naples. It's interesting, too, how, like, he was so focused on music that he had no idea what he was even supposed to do. And so his dad's like, uh, let me just arrange this marriage really fast because you haven't been paying attention at all for the last 18 years. It seems like it never occurred to never him. Never occurred to him. That like, he should have any sort of dating life or social life or anything. Or that maybe one day, like, Luigi falls off a horse. Right. You know what I mean? Like, anything. That like, was happening constantly. He's not going to get hit 1500s. by a car, but, you know, yeah, maybe like a terrible horseback riding accident. He gets hit by a tree. I don't know. Something weird. It seemed to come as a major shock to him. Total shock. In an era where it's like, that's not that shocking. People die very young. Dude, he you know? he made it to, he, like, are you kidding? This doesn't <laughs> happen. He had, I mean, we just, again, you're going to read, you know, all these, what's his, his mom had five brothers, you know, they're like eight kids, three died, like. Yeah. Not it surprising. It was very consistently happening. So it really didn't seem normal that he would be surprised by this or that he wouldn't prepare for it at all, you know? Like, what if I have to take over? What if I have to get married? You Not know? at all. He was just doing music. So in all the research that was done for the episode, every time his future wife Maria is described, they say things in a, like a slut shamey way, basically. Yeah. They politely say things like she had a healthy sexual appetite, you know, but That's the best case scenario. Worst case scenario, they just flat out say awful things about her just being basically in their mind slutty. So Maria's backstory is that basically she had first been married at the age of 15. And with the slut shaming thing, legend had it that she fucked her husband to death. Yeah, that's exactly it that he died in the middle of them having sex because he just couldn't keep up with her. Right. Naturally, it was her fault. It's her fault. She, yeah, is broken because of it. Yes. And she's promiscuous and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Maria had two children with her second husband, who then died of a massive coronary, which also resulted in all these rumors that she had fucked him to death as well. Yeah, so she's like under 21 and has fucked to death two men, two grown men who at this point are probably in their 50s or some shit. You know what right. I mean? And she's like 12. But I mean, it's old timey. Yeah, it's just terrible. I mean, the way that we treat women, the way that we talk about women, the way that sexuality is portrayed during this era, it's clear that she was villainized. For having multiple husbands when the reality is they married a teenager and were older and so they died because life expectancy was not very long. But then it was 
put upon her as part of her being blamed for things. So her story to me is just extremely tragic because from the time of being a young teenager, she was this figure that kept fucking men to death, basically. Yeah. Everywhere she went, it was just people whispering about her being a slut, basically. It was really sad. I'm sure that did nothing for her with like her girlfriends, if she even had any, right? Probably because not. of it. Jeez. And then also, I could see it in old timey being very easy to be like Elizabeth Taylor with eight marriages at like, you know, 35 or something crazy because they all just keep dying mm -hmm. because they take younger wives. It's like, and at some point they got to stop marrying you. Right. But then there's somebody like Carlo who's desperate who will take you later in your old age of 28. <laughs> So it's safe to say that rumors always followed her and men were quite aggressive because of people's perception of her, right? You know, because all these rumors are flying, men are taking a lot of liberties and being really inappropriate with her. Well, they're testing the waters. It's awful. Even Carlo's uncle, Giulio, made sexual advances towards Maria but she shut him down and threatened to tell Carlo what he had done. Good for her. Absolutely. Stick up for yourself. I mean, this is really, this happened to her. She did nothing to deserve this. And it's just like, she's finally saying, hey, fuck off. He was probably 68 years old too. Right? Although it was an arranged marriage, Carlo still proposed and she said yes. But their marriage was strictly for the purpose of procreation, so there really wasn't much romance to speak of. Together, they had a son, Emmanuel. The newlyweds moved into Palazzo San Severo, a 16th century palace in Naples, which still stands today and is open for visitors. I really, if we ever make it to Italy and do live shows or anything cool, we need to go here. Oh, absolutely. I think we should go. It sounds cool. It's a museum now, too. And it has, I think it was, the number is either three or it could be five. But there are some works of art, like some of the greatest sculptures of like, you know, there's a lot of Catholic sculptures of Jesus directly after he's died and he's like his dead body and stuff, right? All those. Damn. Yeah, that sounds like fun, right? Yes. But it's all very old and pretty. <laughs> San Severo. <laughs> Dead Pretty Jesus is what you're trying to sell yes, me on? Yes, that's the one. Dead Pretty <laughs> Jesus. There's a name. It's very, very famous. It's like one of the most famous, but, you know, that detail skipped over that. Not long after their son's birth, Carlo's attention shifted back to his music, which left little to no time for his new wife, who felt extremely neglected and upset. While Carlo was completely ignoring Maria... She became overwhelmingly lonely, and she sought solace in her active social life. She met Don Fabrizio Carafa, the third Duke of Andrea, and the seventh Count of Ruvo at a party. Fabrizio's Roman god good looks was all anyone could talk about, and people would always say how handsome he was. It seems like he was kind of a celebrity just for his looks. Absolutely. Right? Com totally known, like the, the hot guy. Fabrizio was married to Maria Carafa, an aristocrat society woman, and they had four children. So after they met at the party, they began having an affair. For a couple of years, Carlo didn't know anything about the relationship because Maria and Fabrizio bribed the servants to keep quiet. But eventually, people began to whisper and word of the affair spread around town. Carlo's uncle Giulio was still upset that Maria had spurned his advances towards her, so when the rumor reached him, he decided to tell Carlo that his wife was cheating on him. Motherfucker. Right? <laughs> God damn, that dirty old man. Just so, like, let it go, you know? That too. It's fucking petty, like, okay, so she didn't want to fuck you. You're old. She's young and spry. 
Yeah, and it's not like he's confessing to the fact that he wants to fuck her. Right. What he's doing is saying she's a fucking whore. Again, over and over again, all the blame is put on her. And I'm not saying it's right what she did. I'm just saying, like, damn, every person has it out for her. For one reason or another, people are just always coming after her. One thing I will say about Fabrizio and Maria's relationship is, for example, she decided she wanted to see him. She would talk to somebody who lived on a street over and would just happen to walk by. Oh, I feel faint. I need to lay down. So he would be in the backyard or in the back garden of this specific person's house. And it was a whole setup. And they would get together and see each other. And they would just kiss. Right. They would just get together and just neck. It seemed like they were genuinely in love. It but really does. But they were both in some sort of marriage that they had to be in because of their status. I mean, this is really common in this era. It's like, okay, we arrange for you to marry this person and that person for whatever social or political reason. Well, you're going to have people that connect with another person. You know, like I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying like that's kind of what you should expect when you put people together that don't love each other. They're going to love someone else. To quote a royal who was in a relationship, there were always three of us in this. Right. Right? I think, yeah, it's just, I don't know. I don't know what they expected from arranged marriages. So not only was Carlo upset that she had cheated, But Maria had given birth to a daughter during this time of the affair. So Carlo became obsessed with the idea that his daughter may not actually be his child. Carlo began plotting his revenge, knowing that if he could prove adultery, according to the aristocratic social codes, it would just be considered justifiable homicide. Well, then, I mean, really, it's just socially, it didn't really matter what happened to her. If she committed adultery because she belonged to him, basically, he could do whatever he wanted because of his status as a nobleman. And just once again, it's Maria caught in the crossfires of other people's bullshit. Yeah. At the time, if adultery could be proven... It was quite normal for men of the Renaissance era to retaliate against their wives. It didn't seem out of the ordinary, even for people that weren't noble, that didn't have any titles or social standing. It was common. But especially when you have that sort of power, especially when you were raised like that, it was very easy to get away with. Their possessions. Pretty much. Yeah. On October 16th, 1590, 24-year-old Carlo announced to his family that he was going to go on an overnight hunting trip, and he left for the night. His servant, Pietro, said that it was a little late to be hunting, to which Carlo replied, quote, you will see the kind of hunting I shall do. There's a bit of speculation that Carlo may have asked Pietro to leave a door unlocked, but really nothing can be proven. And it's also so old-timey, you know, some things get lost. I mean, the keys were made of wood. (laughs) Right. Exactly. But um, there is just some murmurings about that, so it's important to point out that he may have been part of the plan. Maria called for her maid, Sylvia, to undress her and stand guard at the bedroom door. She had heard Fabrizio whistle to give the signal that he was outside, and she was going to let him in through the balcony like usual. This was kind of their typical way to spend an evening together, give a signal, and then he comes in. When Carlo returned early in the morning, he came in with three armed men through an unlocked door and found his own bedroom door to be locked, which was not normal. He broke down the bedroom door to find Maria and Fabrizio, quote, in flagrante. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Or, quote, in the act, in their bed, in his own house. Maria's maid, Sylvia, hid under a bed in the next room, and she heard Carlo scream out, quote, 
kill that scoundrel along with this harlot, shall a Gesualdo be made a cuckold. That's all this is about. Without a second thought, Carlo wrestled Fabrizio to the ground, then stabbed him repeatedly with a sword throughout his entire body. After Fabrizio was clearly dead, he turned his attention to Maria, who was still on the bed. She fought fiercely as he was beating her face. Then he stabbed her in the right arm, the right hand, and the torso. Finally, Carlo cut her throat and mutilated her body, including her genitals, to defile and embarrass her just as much as possible. The three men that he brought with him came out of the bedroom first. Then Carlo emerged from the doorway covered in blood. He suddenly stopped in his tracks, then stood still for a second and said, quote, I do not believe they are dead. He turned around to re-enter the bedroom, where he continued to mutilate the pair, who were clearly already deceased by this point. This is what we call an overkill. I mean, really, it was just they had been long gone, and he just kept going. The servant Pietro was instructed to keep everyone calm and prevent the female servants from screaming. Carlo dragged both Maria and Fabrizio's bodies outside to the front courtyard, leaving them both mostly naked and their bodies mutilated for everyone to see. I mean, he was out to just humiliate them and hurt them in the worst way possible, even in death. Yeah. And like as the warning, you know, like, don't mess with Carlo. Look what happens to you. Making an example of them. So tough. Carlo fled on horseback to the town of Gesualdo Campania, where his family had a castle. He believed that there he would be protected from anyone trying to punish him for the murders, including Maria and Fabrizio's families. I mean, that's going to be the only people coming after you. Right. I mean, if you think about it because of his status, the law isn't really focused on holding him accountable, but he's more concerned about retaliation than the law, which is telling about his status and, you know, how things worked back then. Yep. The next morning, Neapolitan officials were alerted and investigators arrived to begin a middle-aged version of forensic crime scene investigation and witness questioning. So obviously we don't have the kind of technology that we do today, but there was a lot of things that they could gather from the scene. That'd be a great show. CSI, Middle Ages. Right. <laughs> Mark Helgenberger coming out <laughs> with some hairstyle. Sylvia, Maria's maid, and Pietro, Gesualdo's servant, detailed what they had seen that night, which remains the most detailed accounts of the crime. Yeah, they wrote statements and they still exist. It's pretty interesting. Servants in the castle told police that during the attack, Carlo went in and out of the bedroom at least twice, but no one dared to intervene and stop him. So he was just, again, like you said, overkill, going back and forth and continuing to mutilate them. It sounds like it was just frantic. Right. But nobody, like, people were clearly emotional about it, but they knew because of his status, no one could jump in and say, hey, stop. They're already dead. Stop. Yeah, no. Fabrizio was wearing one of Maria's nightgowns with black silk ruffles and fringe at the bottom, which added to his flamboyant reputation. Mentioned all the time, also. Yeah. According to investigators, he was, quote, covered in blood and pierced with many wounds. There were injuries to his head, face, neck, chest, stomach, kidneys, arms, hands, and shoulders. Essentially, his entire body yeah, that's all was just it. riddled with stab wounds. He had a massive head wound, and his brain was reportedly coming out of his skull. Fabrizio also had a gunshot wound through his elbow that went out through his breast where his shirt was singed with gunpowder. Like one or the other. 
is going to be enough. But we're going to do both here, and we're going to shoot him and stab him with a sword through and through and through multiple times in and out of the room. And it seemed like the stabbing happened first and the shooting afterwards. What is the motivation for this to th- to make other women afraid? Like, you never cheat on me. Or is this, you don't fuck with Carlo's woman? Like, the motivation in the long term. I'm sure he's not thinking this way. But it's just like, wh- who are we doing this for? Yeah, I mean, I think blind rage is just the first thing. But then, of course... He's sitting there like, nobody can do this to me. I'm a prince. You don't fuck with me. Whether it's Maria or Fabrizio, I think that it's just people in general. Like, no one's going to get one over on me. I'm the one in charge here, and nobody else matters. I agree. Maria was wearing a blood-soaked nightshirt. Her genitalia had been specifically mutilated, and she had also received many stab wounds from the same sword. But it seems like the way that it's talked about, like Fabrizio had more stab wounds, and she had more targeted stab wounds. You know what I mean? Like he was focused on a sexual component with her, whereas Fabrizio was rage and just his entire body well he also got him on the ground like he pummeled him to the ground and then stabbed him and she was still on the bed so she was covered in defensive wounds like way more than Fabrizio because he could only fight back so much because he was dead like nearly instantly right so she was able to fight back a little more so yeah and it's just the whole thing it's just it's not a good scene it's gruesome very and I mean it's old timey so it's gonna be pretty gnarly yeah they all are yeah In the bedroom, there were many holes on the ground underneath pools of blood where it was clear to investigators that a sword went through the body and into the floor repeatedly. The middle-aged CSI described this again and again, just holes piercing the wooden floor below his body. All the evidence and witness statements clearly showed that Maria and Fabrizio had met a brutal end specifically at the hands of Carlo Gesualdo. There was nothing else pointing in any other direction. Despite the fact that Carlo had obviously killed two people, because of his status as a nobleman, there was virtually no investigation beyond what the police had initially found the day that they showed up to the scene. Although it was obvious that Carlo had murdered them, Because he was in such a high position of power, the police never charged him of any crime. In fact, the Grand Court Vicaria actually declared that no crime had been committed. I mean, come on. They didn't even, like, write a note in a file? That's crazy to me. That's unbelievable. No crime. And we've got tons of witnesses because the bodies were dragged out into the courtyard. How many people saw them dead? And then all the authorities say, nope, no crime. Like the middle-aged filing cabinet, right, with scrolls. There's got to be, somebody needs to put a scroll in there that says, this happened on this day. Just, right. just you know, a th- paper trail. Just a thought. Throw it in the safety deposit box yeah. for the future. You just never know. Unbelievable. Seriously. Nothing. It blows me away. It's something that you know, you know what I mean? Like, you know that people in positions of power have ways of getting out of justice. They can escape it. They don't get held accountable. You know that. But just to see such a blatant case like this that's just so disturbing, it's not any sort of um, argument for being an accident or anything. It is completely deliberate, premeditated, like gruesome, brutal murder. And the authorities say no crime has been committed because he's a prince. Yeah, there's crazy. Two people are dead, but no crime has been committed. So therefore, how'd they die? (laughs) What's their cause of death? Like, I got a lot of questions. I'll never get the answer. I need to see that autopsy report. I need to see a lot of reports, a lot of scrolls. Natural causes. Send them to SoCal. So Carlo went on just happily living. Natural causes. In... <laughs> Sorry. That took a second? Yeah. <laughs> so after this, since they filed no charges, he just went on living his life, working on his music like nothing had happened. 
Although his privilege meant the legal system let him off, he clearly felt guilty to some degree since he began unraveling after the murders. Legend has it that after the murders, Carlo became obsessed with the idea of the victim's family members seeking retribution against him and becoming extremely paranoid. He went on a spree of cutting down every tall tree on the family estate so he could increase his visibility and see any potential threat coming his way from every direction. About a year after the murders, Carlo's father passed away, and this is when he officially became Prince of Venosa and the eighth Count of Conza. So now, great, now this murderer is even more powerful than he was when he got away with murder. Just a year later. Now that he was officially a prince, it was important for him to find a wife. So he wouldn't be a bachelor and he could distance himself from, of course, the scandal of murdering his previous wife. He may not have been held accountable in a court of law, but the court of public opinion was not on his side. Right. Even if there wasn't any justice for the murders, it was certainly still gossiped about. Carlo arranged his own second marriage, and on February 21st, 1594, he married Leonora de Este, the niece of Duke Alfonso II, the family descendants from the House of Este. The Estes weren't the kind of church folk that Carlo had grown up with. Their court was full of elite musicians, so basically marrying Leonora was also a great business plan. Yeah, he he sought her out. He's like, I'm just going to go into this looking for something self-serving I'm for my business, right this for my talent, because mm-hmm. you know I'm the best. So I got to surround myself with the best. Just ask him. He'll tell you. <laughs> the same year as their wedding, he began extended travels throughout Ferrara, which was an area well known for progressive music in Italy. One of the biggest goals of traveling in Ferrara was to meet one of the leading composers of the time. I'm going to fuck this up. Luzzatsco Luzzacci. Yeah, Luzzatsco Luzzacci. Luzzacci. I'm I'm really bad. Luzzatsco Luzzacci. Sounds good. (laughs) That'll do. Just call him Lu... uh. Thank you for just being supportive and saying it sounds okay. It sounds great. (laughs) I support. So he was really after this meeting guy. this famous <laughs> <laughs> composer that he looked up to, right? It was part of the reason that he was traveling this specific area. Letters written during these travels reveal that Carlo was an extremely difficult person. He was rude. He slept late. He talked about music incessantly. But beyond that, he would always proclaim that his music was the best and how he could write better songs than anyone else. Ugh, this guy's exhausting. He's awful. I mean, again, it's just the complex of one, being nobility to begin with, plus having some sort of talent and being a middle-aged rock star, you know? It created an awful monster. Carlo often didn't show up on time or even at all for his appointments, and then he'd force people to reschedule around him. And I mean, he's supposed to be a professional. He's supposed to be a musician. People are really trying to work with him. So imagine every time you try to collaborate, he's not showing up, and then he's like, all right, so you got to meet me at this time instead. Yeah. All they talk about in these letters how obnoxious he is and about how he has no concept of time yeah that is again and again and again over and over time and not only that but like it's his world we just live here it's his time his clock not what i was going to say is like it's not even about time in general and just kind of like oh i lost track of time so i'm late no it's kind of a power move it is where he's like my time is more important and you will meet me when i say you're going to meet me Because I'm more important and your time is less valuable. Yes. It was just, he was flexing. It was just an obnoxious move. The letters are great. 
He dismissed his colleagues as beneath him and declared himself the authority on every subject. One letter describes a day with the prince saying he, quote, liked to do nothing but sing and play music. Today, he forced me to visit with him and kept me for seven hours. This guy's done. He's just like, this traveling companion is bullshit. <laughs> he, yeah, he's just trying to control people. Although one of his goals was to meet his musical hero, Carlo began saying that the composer Luzasco Luzacci was it close? That was great. Wasn't that great. So he did a complete 180. Before, he really needed to meet this guy. He's one of his heroes. Now, all of a sudden, he planned to tell him to his face that he was not that talented. Many letters from this time offer a window into Carlo's state of mind, and it's clear that Carlo desperately needed to be impressive and admired by people. His low self-esteem and narcissism led him to constantly talk about how great he was, and he took every opportunity to let people know how wonderful he was. He surrounded himself with all the leading composers, and while in Ferrara, he published his first book of madrigals. In 1595, Carlo returned to his estate in Gesualdo and released some of his best work composing madrigals. Most of the compositions were morose but were still notably more expressive and emotional than a lot of the other music coming out during the Renaissance. I'm telling you, it is. What am I looking for here? It's something that you fall asleep to. It's something that it's just boring. It's just sound. Because we're so used to, you know, auto-tune. How about a guitar? Anything, right? These voices and like you can appreciate it for what it is. They're very talented. Yeah. But damn. But comparatively. Oh, yeah. And his just... was like rip roaring at the time. <laughs> you know? Yeah. He was really revered. I mean, people really loved him and liked his work. But to us, it's just so different from the music of today. Yes. Carlo turned his property into basically like a live work studio for a lot of local musicians. It became like Andy Warhol's factory or 1960s Laurel Canyon with many different musicians living at the home and working there with Carlo. Carlo bankrolled everyone's extravagant lifestyle and they all honed their skills and collaborated together while living on his property. The songs that came from these collaborations had emotional themes of life and death, love and pain. Although the law hadn't punished Carlo, it was clear that he had extreme guilt for the murder of Maria that he struggled with for the rest of his life. He was also suffering from a variety of physical ailments and he would try any method possible to relieve his severe asthma and chronic constipation. He also did this thing where he had a male servant sleep with him every night, specifically to cling to his back to keep him warm. I don't get it. it really, to me, it's like a human heated blanket. And to me, it says, again, People aren't people to him. Servants aren't human beings. Like anybody can be owned. Oh, that's Joe Smith. He's my blanket. You know what I mean? Absolutely. It just shows like this how little value that he has for anybody else's life. Yeah. I know. I saw some people speculating that maybe it was like a male protection thing. Maybe he's worried that somebody's going to get him in the middle of the night or whatever. Right. It's, it's his bodyguard. Maybe. maybe. That's possible. But I just, I have a visual of what this looks like. And it's the John Lennon, Yoko Ono, black and white. And it's bizarre is what it is. Because like sometimes he's got on, you know, middle-aged clothes and sometimes he's not. Yeah. I, I just, don't get it. 
to me, yeah, I see what you're saying. And I definitely didn't think about the aspect of security because I kind of automatically assume that he's got like people guarding his door. I would too. You know, but I think for me, it made most sense to just treat this human being as if they're actually an object, just a blanket. Like, oh, I'm cold. We don't have heaters. Then you're going to sleep on my back. Maybe it's a protective blanket. Yeah. It's, both. it's a weighted blanket. It's I have a weighted one of those. Blanket. It makes it's feel both. good. Keep your anxieties calm. <laughs> but yeah, it's important to point out that that's something that was normal for him at this time. You know, also, I mean, what if he was having nightmares and flashbacks because of what he did? You know, and he would wake up and need to have someone comfort him. I don't know. But something was going on. Yeah, something. He would try anything to improve his health and began practicing witchcraft with his mistresses, Aurelia Dierico and her friend, Polly Sandra. He also channeled his struggle with his illness into his art. And when he did, people often considered them masterpieces. Some of his, you can hear the difference in like the early stuff and then to the later stuff that he did. And I mean, it's, it is really like wonderful for the time and you can see the difference. So there must be something to it because you can tell. So I know nothing about madrigals. Like that's what's becoming. <laughs> you sound clear. like you're really trying to sell it, though. You're like, I yeah, am because you know, there's a big difference. Because I did find myself <laughs> stuck with it on for a long time, and just like this is okay. There's something calming about it. Mm. Weighted blanket, yeah, yeah. You know, that might be it. Throughout this time, Carlo had been writing to his new wife Leonora and begging her to join him, but she always declined. In 1597, Leonora finally agreed to move back to Carlo's home in Gesualdo, and soon after, their son, Alfonsino, was born. As soon as he got what he wanted and was able to sweet-talk Leonora into coming back, Carlo did a complete 180 and became extremely abusive. He also began cheating more often and spending more time doing witchcraft with his mistresses Aurelia and Polysandra. At this point, Leonora decided that she'd had enough and she wouldn't look the other way while he had affairs. She retaliated by ordering that Carlo's two main side chicks be tried for witchcraft. She definitely can't do anything to him. Right. So we got to punish these two chicks who he more than likely roped into this. It's just so sad. I mean, she had no other choice. It was her only way to either stop the affairs or get back at him. But at the time, she has no power in relation to him. So this is really the only thing she can do. And then these two women have to suffer for his actions. With their family's power, Leonora was able to ensure that Aurelia Dierico and Polysandro were thoroughly investigated, sent to trial, and would indeed be found guilty. Renaissance court records describe one of Aurelia and Carlo's rituals, saying that she, quotes, made the prince drink her menstrual blood as a purgative that was established by four witnesses to extrajudicial confessions by the defendant. Aurelia declared that the aforementioned Polisandra had told her that if she would make a slice of bread and place it inside her nature, and after it was saturated with her own seed, she would give it to the prince to eat with sauce, it is established through the doctor's deposition that the seed is harmful. She rolled up bread put it in her crotch, blood all over it, and then fed it to him. And this was supposed to rid him of his physical ailments. I just don't even nope. have the strength to nope. unpack all of this. Don't want to do it. It just disturbs me so much. And it's not like, obviously, I'm comfortable with 
people's bodies and blah, blah, blah. But just the idea of doing these rituals, like this sounds like some shit that maybe like Gwyneth Paltrow would put on Goop today, you know? Yeah. Like she's got that vagina candle, right? People now, do some wacky one. ass shit, but I just can't imagine a world where this is okay that someone could sell me on that concept of just like, hey, this coming out of your body is something that's going to just rid me of my ailments. And I have a ton of health issues like we've discussed. Okay. You're telling me. I would not me, try this. Wait a minute. You're telling me if you went to the doctor and they're like, listen, this is all that there is. This is what you have to do and it will heal you. And you need to believe. And when you believe, it will happen. And the day you believe, right, you're cured. But until then, you got to eat this period blood bread. Period toast? Period toast. You need to eat Paula Sanders period toast. You know what I'd say? On rye. I need a second opinion. This is probably <laughs> the origin of second opinions. I can tell you. This is where it came from. <laughs> this has got to be where it came from. I'll just, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I think I'll live with my affliction. Right? Like, I mean, he's got asthma and constipation. I can live with okay, that. chronic. Chronic constipation. Yeah, you know. There's no opioid crisis. So, like. <laughs> I was going to say. I, I sort of got That's where my brain goes. First place. So I'm just like, what's he on? Uh, but, I mean, he just, he's he's got a lot of. I don't want to say like he's a mess, like he thinks because there's people out there that do witchcraft and you know, right. but there's plenty of people that believe in rituals sure. and have different Faith. spiritual beliefs and that I'm all about. But I think that this is so clearly a way for him to punish himself and get over things and work through things. I don't think this is about his health. I think this is about what's really eating him emotionally. It could easily just be like, oh, these women will have sex with me if I do this. OK, I'll I'll do this and they will have sex with me. Like you went to high school, right? But he's a prince. OK, he just he wasn't takes all... whatever he wants, you no, know, but, but it feels good to be wanted, I guess. Oh, it's intoxicating. Maybe they were like, you know what? Period. Toast. If you do this, <laughs> I want you. I don't know. I, I don't get I that. can't understand it at all. We got to just move past right. it. Right. We just can't really focus too much on I it. I almost skipped this entirely. But it is just telling to me that he was really searching. Whether we say that it's for his health That's or true. for forgiveness, like this is really a sign that he's willing to do anything to get better. And to me, I think that's emotionally. He's saying it's physically, but I think it's got to be both. Nowadays, he would have an Instagram account called like Carlo's Journey, and it would right? be him going to different witch Before doctors and after pics. <gasps> exactly. And yeah, I mean, he was just on a journey. He was on a path of like I need to get better because he knew he fucked up and was never hold held accountable. So he needed to do something. So of course, after all these inflammatory, like you know how woke we are today about bodies, about women, and us to being women. So you can only imagine a courtroom filled with, you know, men and women and whatever, having a reaction to this testimony. Like, it was a huge scandal, right? Yeah. So both women were found guilty. They were given prison time to be served in Gesualdo's castle. But while they were in custody, Carla would still visit and sleep with them. When they were put into the prison, they were put in cells next to each other in the same wing, in the same area, thought to be a punishment to him because he could visit both of these women at the same time, implying that they're like, old biddies that are going to be all over his ass, right? Like, you know, giving him shit all the time. But I was like, well, but, you know, he's probably still sleeping with them. And he doesn't have to go sit and listen to these women. Like, what are you talking about? But to do his little rituals still, right? right. He'd have to go see them. He so, still had access to them. Exactly. It was all and, set up. And I don't know, in my mind, I'm like, if these women were sent to jail by him, by his doing, basically, with his wife and whatnot... Would they really want to sleep with him after that? So to me, it feels like, was he just going and having non-consensual sex with them, but he had access to them all the time because he could just go to the jail? 
there's just questions it brings up for me. Like, I doubt that that sex is consensual. Like, the person that sent me to jail, I'm not really eager to fuck, you know? No kidding. So there's a lot of questions here for me. But we can't say this because there's an entire love and life after lockup. So I'm just saying, old timey, I'd watch that show. (laughs) She's my goddess. I've got to be with her in a heartbeat. Yes. Come on. In prison and everything next to each other. Let's write this show. (laughs) In the year 1600, Leonora gave birth to a second son, Alfonsino, who tragically died when he was only a few days old. I'm pretty sure both kids are the same name, by the way. That was not like a... That was not a typo. No, I'm serious. Like I know. All I found was the same thing. It's all the same. They don't care. The death of Carlo's son caused him to fall into a time of deep depression, including a period of self-imposed exile in the castle. After their son passed away, Carlo beat Leonora way more often and more viciously. Her family, the Estes, tried to obtain a divorce from the Pope for her, but because of the stigma she decided she didn't want to go through with it. It was, it's just so sad to me. It was worse to her, the idea of getting a divorce, than the idea of enduring this abuse. Well, I think at this time, I think if you get a divorce, you go to hell. I believe it's a sin still, unless it's granted by the Pope. That's why they're like, oh, we need to get it from here. You've got to get the Pope involved. Otherwise, it's not okay. Right. I might be wrong, but I believe that's part of the stigma thing. This is well out of the area of my expertise. Yeah, mine too. <laughs> Instead, she tried to stay away from Carlo as much as possible and often stayed with her brother in Modena. Once again, while Leonora was gone, Carlo would pine for her and beg for her to come back. But as soon as she returned to Carlo, he was horrible to her again. It was just this cycle back. Like he had to have her, couldn't let it go, you know? It's obsessive. Very. In the early 1600s, madrigals began to go out of style while opera and orchestras gained massive popularity. Carlo had a painting commission to put in his church that pictured some of the people in his life, including Maria, the wife he had murdered, along with other deceased people that he cared for, like his uncle and his newborn son that passed away. In the painting, the deceased were all held up by angels, and Carlo himself was at the edge of purgatory, asking the Virgin Mary to help him. That's deep guilt. I mean, really, it's just eating him up. We're painting pictures? To put in churches? Wildly guilty. Although externally Carlo was able to carry on with his life as though he'd never murdered his wife, it was clear that he was still struggling with his guilt. He hired 10 to 12 male servants that were reportedly there to beat him and engage in acts of self-flagellation three times a day. It's a lot. His oldest son, by Maria, died just weeks before Carlo did, probably causing his mental state to deteriorate even faster. On September 8, 1613, Carlo died of unknown causes at the age of 47. Ripe old 47. I mean, that's straight up elderly in 1600. ARP since the 35. Right. <laughs> He was buried at the chapel of St. Ignatius, but in 1688, an earthquake destroyed the tomb and the church was built over it, although the burial plaque is still visible. It's believed that Maria's ghost still haunts San Severo to this day and wanders the halls at night looking for her lover, Fabrizio. I really want to go there. I've just got this in my head now. It's on the yeah, list. Yeah, you seem about it. This episode, you're like, Italy, need to go, gotta go. I could listen I've got to things to visit. In real life. 
right? With a glass of wine. I could do this. Italy's definitely top on my list right now. Yeah. Let's go. (laughs) So Othello was written in 1603 and it's set in Venice, Italy. So there's some people that believe that Shakespeare may have drawn a bit of inspiration from current real life scandal of Carlo Gesualdo. I am personally of the opinion that, yes, this this seems to track for me. Yeah. I mean, it's not the exact thing, but I think that there's plenty of points to draw there to be like, oh, I can use this as inspiration. I could use that. This sort of reaction, this, you know, the heightened emotions coming from a real story. It makes a lot of sense. It was the Middle Age Inquirer scandal. Like it was everywhere. It was trial of the century, you know, no trial, just the murder of the century. Right. To celebrate what would have been Carlo's 400th birthday in 1966, Momentum Pro Gesualdo, a ballet, was composed by Gesualdo admirer Igor Stravinsky. Introducing him to a whole nother world of people. New generation. Generation, not a world. Discovering madrigals. There it is. And that's the story of Carlo Gesualdo. The man who murdered two people and was never held accountable because it's old timey. It's old timey. There is also another legend that floats around all this research that he murdered the baby in question of whether it was Fabrizio's by putting it in a swing and swinging it from a tree branch over and over until it died. I do not believe that. But there's just so much like it's just, yeah, he kills people. He does this. He's an asshole and he has no respect for anyone's time. It seems a little bit far-fetched, but at the same time, we know these other things happen. Old timey. There's too many witnesses to the murders to think that the murders didn't happen, but the baby is kind of a stretch. I agree. Yeah. So So that's pretty much it. Yeah, that was fun. (laughs) So if you want to read a little bit more, we have a ton of resources for this particular episode. So check out the links in the show notes and definitely check out the links to our social media if you want to follow us and join in on the breaking news and memes. And man, people have been posting a lot. I've been slacking, but other people have been posting. I Yeah, thank you. I've been in like crazy, like, I don't want to say newlywed thing, but this sinus mm-hmm. infection is definitely probably the bigger issue. Is like, I have not been taking care of social media because I just want to like lay down and sleep off my antibiotics. <laughs> That's a dream right there. So I really appreciate there's so many people that have been posting lately. And so I see you and thank you and you're awesome. Um, And then if you want to join our Patreon, I don't have the list for this week because, again, antibiotics. Next week. It's fine. (laughs) It's fine. But, um, yeah, I will read that next week. So definitely um, if you want to join and get ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, a lot of extra content and early release whenever available, then join our Patreon, patreon.com slash Murder Dictionary Podcast. And we still have shirts, phone cases, and all sorts of merch available at Threadless. The link's in the show notes. And am I forgetting anything, Court? I can't think of anything. There's a lot of crime TV. I'll I'll narrow it down. Dude, there's just been so, there's so much many new specials. So every we're channel all has over an Aaron that. Hernandez special. Just <sighs> so you know, that's like a prerequisite to having a channel. You have to have an Aaron Hernandez special right I'm now. I'm so sick of him. Like so sick of it. I'm a, I, yeah. He's becoming the new Ted Bundy for me. Personally. Oh, he's your Bundy. Got I'm just it. like. No, I don't want to see it. And of course, there's new Bundy stuff coming out. Always. Yeah. The the girlfriend is uh-huh. going to be releasing now something. Okay. And it's like, I know I'm going to watch it. Yeah, we will. I'm Because it's from her perspective and I'm going to tell myself that that's going to make it somehow different. Somehow. It's going to be the same information that we have heard Give 30 it a feminist times. feminist spin. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so anyway, right. we'll be busy. I'm going to be on the couch getting better, watching some more true crime docs. And hopefully we will see you next week with another music story. Another one. Yep. 
Sounds good. So see you next time. Hope you have a good week and we'll see you soon. Bye.